Well, uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Dan Weiner uh, from the National Research Council. Uh, bienvenue à toutes et à tous uh, à notre discussion uh, de la uh, science ouverte. Just welcome to everyone to our discussion of uh, open science in Canada. As I think as many of you are aware, in February this year, the Office of our Chief Science Advisor released a uh, federal roadmap for open science. And uh, while the initial implementation is really focused on uh, federal uh, departments and agencies, two of the recommendations are related to the need for a national approach to federally funded uh, extramural research, recognizing the international trends in this direction. So uh, we have a panel today of uh, five speakers. I'm really pleased to introduce each, each of whom has a unique perspective uh, and, and some experience uh, working in an open science environment. Uh, in order of their presentations, we have uh, uh, um, uh, Dr. Mona Neymar, uh, who's our Chief Science Advisor of the Government of Canada, uh, Professor uh, Tanya Bula, who is a, dean, uh, a professor and Dean of uh, Faculty of Health Sciences at Simon Fraser University, Professor Cheryl Aerosmith, uh, who is Professor of Medical uh, Biophysics at U of T and co-founder of the Structural Genomics Consortium. We have John Bagger, um, who uh, hasn't checked in, but uh, we're hoping that he'll come in shortly, who is the director of Triumph, and he's also soon to be the CEO of the American Physical Society, where he'll be handling some of the uh, open science publishing issues um, directly. And finally, uh, Professor Peter Pulsifer from uh, the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Carleton University. So, um, so with this, what I'd like to do is, is just to uh, ask each of our uh, presenters to give a five minute overview. I'd like to start with, 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 with Mona Neymar uh, and ask her to say a few words about the, open, uh, the federal open science roadmap and some of her perspectives as we move this uh, forward. So over to you, Mona. Well, uh, merci beaucoup, Dan. Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, alors, uh, good morning, uh, bonjour, bon dimanche uh, à tout le monde uh, devant l'écran qui nous écoutait uh, ce matin. Et merci aux organisateurs uh, de m'avoir invité à participer à cette importante uh, discussion sur la science ouverte. So, thanks to the Royal Society of Canada, uh, Dan, Darren, as well, for putting together this discussion. As you know, open science is very important to me personally, and it is um, a top priority for the Office of the Chief, Chief Science Advisor. Uh, I'm grateful for all the input that uh, I will be receiving today. I'm grateful for all the input and for the all the help that we have received in developing uh, the roadmap. I had a committee to which uh, several of the Royal Society of Canada uh, esteemed members uh, contributed, uh, including, of course, uh, Dan, but also Chad Gaffield and uh, Angel Patry, who was uh, inducted uh, just uh, yesterday. So, uh, I, I actually, before I start on the on the open science, if, if I may be allowed to just say a big thank you and acknowledge the incredible support that I have received over the past several months uh, from the research community, from many of the members of the Royal Society of Canada, who generously participated in many of the expert panels, who have provided uh, advice uh, to myself and uh, to government, and of course, who are carrying out research that is advancing our understanding and our ability to manage this crisis. I can tell you that this has been an unprecedented mobilization that has not gone unnoticed uh, by the top decision makers in the country and for that matter, by our uh, government as well. Result of, of, uh, of course, uh, uh, all this is that science is informing uh, uh, policy almost in real time. And this is enabled in uh, large part by the uh, by basically the open science approach to the to the research, the science, the data, the results uh, of the COVID nineteen uh, research that many of you uh, are carrying out. Uh, earlier on uh, in the pandemic, uh, actually very early on, I joined uh, a number of my counterparts uh, across uh, across the world in calling on the scientific publishers uh, to uh, make uh, all the data and the research output on COVID-19 openly uh, accessible. 
and uh, they have responded uh, positively, as as you know, and I'm very grateful for this. But uh, the result has been that uh, you know the, we we have gone from not knowing anything about a virus to having a highly effective diagnostic diagnostic uh, tool for that matter tools. Uh, to detecting it uh, in record time, less than two months, and basically in less than 10 months, having uh, effective vaccines to prevent the infection. So I think this has been, uh, you know, if we needed a demonstration on how um, important uh, open science is, on how it can stimulate collaborations, on how it can stimulate innovation, I think I think we've seen it. And it's now uh, upon us to make sure that this momentum that has been uh, basically gathered uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic around open science continues beyond. So, um, uh, and uh, uh, with this, I guess, um, you know, I will uh, say that um, as Dan mentioned, uh, we had the committee that uh, proposed uh, this uh, the open science uh, roadmap that was uh, embraced uh, by our, our government, and essentially the the open roadmap uh, centers around five principles. Um, they they may seem obvious, but I think once we understand them and make sure that we address them, uh, I think we're going to be in in great shape. And this is what I look forward from this panel and from this discussion. So the, the five uh, basically uh, principles are, or, or, or uh, um, uh, you know, uh, key elements are people, uh, as in the people who do the research, people who actually uh, move uh, the um, open science forward. So uh, pub meaningful engagement is extremely important. And this is, you know, today's is an example of such transparency uh, and we're going to hear from, I think, the presenters about the FAIR uh, principles and when is it that, uh, what's the principle by which um, uh, open by default cannot apply and the, the data should remain uh, closed. Inclusiveness is extremely important and inclusiveness as in, you know, across scientific disciplines, but as well across knowledge systems as well so that's also very important collaboration is an uh, is evident there collaboration not only between discipline but between sectors because for open science to work we need collaboration between government institutions and the researchers uh, themselves and last but not least sustainability we need to have a sustainable uh, approach uh, to open science and one that allows the long-term vision uh, really to be realized and to be uh, to be maintained. So, with this in mind, I'd like to. I'm, I'm again extremely grateful uh, for the the panelists who will uh, provide us with their uh, thoughts, and also for all of you who will provide uh, the discussion elements, uh, thoughts as well, and uh, guidance. So, uh, if I may, I would like to leave you with a few questions uh, for the for the deliberations of today and also moving forward. Uh, so the first one is, how do we best go about developing a pan-Canadian open science strategy while taking into consideration privacy, security, ethical and intellectual property issues? Second question, how can we support the Tri-Council in better realizing the goals of their open access policy, because they do have one, and ultimately building a culture of open science among the research community. Third, how do we ensure that the recent enthusiasm for open science lasts beyond the current pandemic? Uh, so I think that if we can answer these questions, we're going to be in, in great shape uh, to realize the timelines that are proposed in, um, in the Open Science Roadmap and have really a pan-Canadian approach to federally funded science. So on this, uh, Dan, I think I will uh, just uh, now listen to what uh, my esteemed colleagues have uh, to say. I certainly look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, and uh, I can assure you that uh, this is going to inform the path 
to a successful transition for the Canadian science community, and I will do everything in my power uh, to help advance uh, open science. Alors là-dessus, je, vous, je laisse la parole aux autres et je vais écouter très attentivement ce que tout le monde a à suggérer. Merci. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mona, for, for those opening comments and, and also for the questions, uh, some of which maybe we'll, we'll try to uh, deal with in our discussion and maybe with some of the audience questions. So uh, let's, I'd like to move to, uh, to Tanya at this point. Uh, so Tanya, you recently co-authored an RSC report on open drug discovery of antivirals critical for Canada's pandemic strategy. So I'm really interested in hearing your perspectives on the opportunities and challenges of open science. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to present today. I'm coming to you from the beautiful um, unceded territories of the Squamish, the Musqueam, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples. So this is our report. Uh, I, I invite you to, to, to delve in a little bit further if you, if you find the topic interesting. But I would just say that in the times of crisis, as Dr. Nemo pointed out, we reflexively turn to open science as a solution. So what is it? Well, open science comprises a set of institutional policies and practices that foster collaborative relationships and infrastructure with minimal reliance on restrictive intellectual property and other rights. It's been instrumental in mission-driven international coordinated efforts for the public good, such as the Human Genome Project or our efforts with COVID-19. However, the increasingly um, sort of policy emphasis on commercialization of public science has, has reduced its scope. The current emphasis on these proprietary principles for foundational technologies and at every further step along the drug discovery continuum diminishes our capacity for collective action to solve complex health problems such as pandemic preparedness and rare and neglected diseases. In anticipation of future pandemics, current models assume that the private sector has an incentive to invest in drugs for emerging threats that may never occur. It does not. This results in uh, market failure. Advanced preparation through development of inexpensive novel drugs against viruses with pandemic potential is possible, but we need a shared strategy, leadership and coordination among industry, academia, government and philanthropy, which we argue an open drug discovery model can provide. Openness for data and research reagents enables quality control and development of standards. It enables repro reproducibility, so checks and balances on results. It avoids unnecessary duplication because people know what everybody else is doing. Uh, it reduces transaction costs, including lengthy delays for negotiation of material and data transfer agreements and other IP terms. Um, it encourages partnerships and collaborations in an environment where tacit knowledge can flow between actors. And with appropriate governance, and this is some of the things, the questions that Dr. Nimer posed, is uh, to make sure that data and materials are not used in ways that may harm individuals and communities. It enhances trust in data and in systems. And what do I mean here? Um, in, in another panel that I was on earlier in, in the week, uh, Dr. Nehmer uh, posed a question about open data for viral sequences and when they can be shared. Um, but uh, even then, you know, there are there are possible harms in that uh, viral sequences may stigmatize particular or specific groups and individuals. So, of course, those uh, issues need to be taken into consideration. So, what prevents us from sharing? Um, as with any complex human deliver, endeavor, um, social dilemmas may impede sharing. And the most common um, from a lot of empirical research, much of which is I, I've done in, in, in my work um, it, with different science communities, these include, you know, it, it involves time and effort to share, share things. Uh, there are technical challenges, uh, a real fear of, of being scooped, an overestimation of value and a sense of ownership potential misinterpretation of liability and privacy rules, so a misestimation of risk, and poorly structured informed consent agreements and, in, and general institutional risk aversion. But research, most notably by uh, Nobel laureate uh, Lynn Ostrom, who kind of led the charge in this area of the knowledge commons, also provides us with principles for good governance that have a lot to do with proportionate rulemaking based on active grassroots participation of all stakeholders. While self-monitoring is preferable, even large entities such as the National Institutes of Health in the US have resorted to the use of sanctions, understanding that there needs to be access uh, also to resolution mechanisms. 
So our Royal Society report argues that it's time to reopen science and actually push the boundaries on that. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because Dr. Arrowsmith is going to go into this in, in quite a bit of uh, detail. But our model maps onto a strategy to accelerate uh, drug discovery um, for a broad spectrum anti of antiviral drugs um, and moving into the, 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 the clinical trial space. But I'll leave that for Dr. Arrowsmith to, to delve into further. So one important caveat, however, is differences in benefits, burdens, and capacity and interests in the inputs and outputs of open science. So just because the data are open doesn't mean that all have the capacity to use those data. And some have interest in stricter controls on how those data are used. So there needs to be reciprocity of all of the actors that are playing in the space or else there is unfairness. And this played out uh, in an earlier pan, uh, potential pandemic uh, with Indonesia blocking access to bird flu samples because they were inputting open data without necessarily having the potential to benefit either from the scientific endeavor or having a guarantee of um, cheaper or better access to the vaccines and drugs developed. So in conclusion, uh, the status quo of proprietary drug discovery from, for pandemic preparedness does not work. In implementing an open science drug discovery alternative, we are building on a deep history of state and philanthropy uh, funded mission oriented science. The political question remains, however, are we more afraid that open science drug discovery will not work or that it will work? Are we afraid that open science will work because it disrupts entrenched interests? Then we should at least test it in domains where those entrenched interests are clearly failing to deliver, such as pandemics and rare and neglected diseases. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Uh, I'd like to move on to Cheryl Aerosmith. Um, Cheryl, uh, the Structural Genomics Consortium um, was actually set up as an open science environment. So I'd really be interested in hearing your, your thoughts on your successes and maybe some of the lessons learned. Good morning. So um, I work in the area of biomedical uh, research and drug discovery. And um, we at the Structural Genomics Consortium have, have uh, promoted this area of open science in this field uh, for over 17 years. Um, we, uh, in addition to data, making our data public, um, we are also making reagents and know-how and, and materials available to the community as well to promote, um, to, to accelerate um, drug discovery and, and more knowledge in, in the biomedical area. So I'd like to tell you briefly about um, uh, our work in this area and um, a couple of success stories. So just a little bit of background. So biomedical science and drug discovery uh, is an area where there's fierce competition as in many areas of, of um, science uh, research. Um, but the, the competition is for um, to be the first to discover and the first to publish, particularly for academics. Uh, and then on top of that, the profit motive associated with perceived profit motive um, associated with drug discovery um, has led uh, inst academic institutions in particular to um, really promote the, the um, protection of uh, intellectual property and, and reagents and materials very early in the drug discovery process, such that it limits uh, their dissemination and the growth of knowledge. And so this leads to secrecy, uh, overuse of patents, much duplication of effort, uh, wasting of resources through duplication and slows down overall the discovery and knowledge dissemination as Dr. Bulo has explained. Um, and so the SGC is a pre-competitive public-private partnership. We work with industry and academia together, striving to catalyze the discovery of new medicines through open science to overcome many of these issues. And so um, with some further detail on the, on the slide that Dr. Bubala showed, um, we are in partnership with uh, the drug discovery industry, a large pharmaceutical companies of a global um, from all over the world, uh, because they recognize that um, the tools and basic knowledge um, derived from uh, early sharing of, of data are of value to them. So when this information is in the public domain and we share tools and we accelerate discovery, um, the pharmaceutical industry and everybody can make better decisions uh, based on this public domain um, 
knowledge and the reagents that are available. Uh, this leads to, uh, we're hoping and we, we, we think that uh, this will lead to fewer failures in the clinic um, by making better decisions on which uh, drug targets to take forward uh, into clinical, the clinical realm. And the reality is that right now the system is not working well. Too many drugs fail in the clinic because uh, we don't fully understand um, human biology. Now we can uh, push forward this, um, this uh, boundary between um, pre-competitive and proprietary re research even further um, as outlined in, in um, uh, Tanya's report uh, and also in, uh, uh, by these nascent uh, companies, um, the so-called uh, medicines for companies, um, medicines for kids, medicines for infectious disease, et cetera, uh, who are working in the areas of market failure where um, they're taking um, drug discovery programs all the way through to the clinic uh, by making the data regularly available and getting input um, from, from um, global players um, in order to try to um, make affordable medicines um, more quickly in areas that the large uh, companies are not working in because there is uh, not a, <clears throat> there's not a market essentially there. And in doing this in the um, infectious disease area and, and pandemic, um, preparedness is very important. So I'd like to tell you a quick story about um, one of our successes. This is in the area of cancer. Um, for a number of years, we had worked in early protein biochemistry and structural biology of the protein called WDR5. And there was literature suggesting that it um, would may be important in leukemia. Um, we partnered with the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research, uh, chem med medicinal chemists in that group, and developed a uh, chemical probe. So this is a drug-like molecule that can be used to test whether WDR5 is a good drug target. And we made it together with WDR5. Now, normally such a molecule would be patented by the, uh, the university that discovered it. Um, it would be shared very in a limited basis through uh, materials transfer agreements and other licenses that would limit the um, number of um, groups that could work on it and, and generally wouldn't make it widely available and therefore um, limit its, um, its exploitation. Um, we, on the other hand, did not patent it. We shared it with groups all around the world who very quickly, within a, in less than a year, uh, showed that it was uh, efficacious in uh, cellular models of leukemia, breast cancer, brain cancer. And this established the therapeutic hypothesis and the business case for further development. So leukemia is an area where um, it does make sense to, to invest uh, in, in it um, by the, <clears throat> the larger companies in biotech. So at this point, we, we uh, at the SGC stepped back, all our data was public. The, um, the, our colleagues at OICR um, had the freedom to operate, to develop, to use that um, open science data and develop their own drug discovery program. So they founded Propylon Therapeutics, um, which was then um, further invested in by Facet and, and Celgene um, to develop the leukemia drug in Canada. So this shows that the open science can accelerate the beginning, the early stages of drug discovery uh, up to the, the demonstration of a, uh, that a target is druggable and a good drug target, and then allow for commercial development. Um, and in this case, particularly in a, in a beneficial way to Canada uh, through the commercial avenue. So the open science and commercialization are not um, at odds with one another under the right conditions. And this is one more quick um, uh, vignette of the uh, drug target G9A on the far left here. We, we published, this was our first chemical probe that we published. We made it freely available. Two separate groups, completely unknown to us, used it, um, it to show the link with um, hemoglobin uh, production in sickle cell disease. And so this established a therapeutic hypothesis for this target in sickle cell disease and inspired the company called Epizyme, an American company, to develop a program for sickle cell disease. Again, if the compound had not been freely available to, uh, to the world, uh, we posit that this may not have happened or may have happened more slowly. So I'll end by saying um, that if we can do open science to cure a pandemic, as the world is trying to do, why not other diseases 
um, where there's great medical need and uh, a need for new drugs. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Cheryl. I understand that uh, after overcoming a technical challenge, uh, John Bagger has managed to join us today, so that's fantastic. Uh, so, uh, John, um, big science, the, uh, in the, the, I can say the big science physics community has had a practice of openly sharing research data for some time. And, uh, and also, I think as you start getting ready for your new role as a CEO of the American Physical Society, I think of some of the issues even related to publishing, which, by the way, will be in uh, a one o'clock session, uh, are, are on your mind as well. But be uh, very interested now in hearing hearing your thoughts on open science uh, practices in your community. Well, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I'm going to be bringing two perspectives here today, that of the elementary particle physics community and also that of the astronomy community. So in particle physics, Collaborations and uh, international cooperation really are an organic part of the field. They grow uh, quite naturally. Uh, these collaborations form around what we call experiments, but they're actually billion dollar facilities, which many smaller teams use to conduct the experiments within these facilities. That is shared freely within the team, but not with the outside world. And one might ask why? But well, one reason is because the experimenters themselves build the equipment. It doesn't come from uh, off the shelf. It's really state of the art. And it often takes a decade or more to construct this facility. And so they really want to exploit it. And second, the data itself is complicated. It's, uh, it's uh, in no standard format because of the uniqueness of each of these facilities. And so it's difficult for others to use it. Case in point, for example, is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which is a multi-billion dollar particle accelerator with two main experiments, ATLAS and CMS, with some 3,000 physicists on each. So Canada itself belongs to ATLAS, and that's in a facility with about 100 million channels of data recording the results of 100 billion collisions a second. So this Atlas detector is recording something like one to two gigabytes of data per second to disk, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It comes out to something like 100 terabytes of data per year. And that huge amount of data is distributed around the world. 10% comes to Canada. But this data is complicated. Every collision is different. There are lots of uh, calibrations and uh, these calibrations differ event by event. So this data is open internally to the collaboration, but that data is locked within that closed ecosystem of a thousand scientists. It's very difficult to share. As I've said, it's expensive to query. Now, of course, the public paid for the data, so perhaps the public has a right to it, but how can they access it? So some simplified data sets and some simplified tools are available, but they're primarily used for outreach and education. They're not really used for citizen science, so true open access will be hard to achieve. On the other hand, in the field of astronomy, open access and citizen science have worked. Data structures and, collabor and calibrations are simpler, and so astronomers have been quick to jump on that bandwagon because it adds value to their science. It adds value through both archives and virtual observatories. In astronomy, the days are long gone when astronomers climb to the mountaintop and they observe the sky with photographic plates. So now they have digitized image and with the start of these digitized images and large surveys, it's possible to create connected global digital libraries called virtual observatories. And so these virtual uh, observatories really rely on consistent metadata, correlated image, and they allow us to correlate images across various wavelengths and even particle types, which really break down the silos for which astronomy used to be famous. An example is the Mikulski Archives for Space Telescopes in the United States. It's named for the uh, uh, U.S. Senator who is the Hubble Space Telescope's perhaps most impassioned advocate. Today, over a thousand papers a year are produced globally with Hubble data, open to all. And over half of this data comes from the archive itself. 
And so Hubble's legacy will last long beyond Hubble is gone. It is really true open science, open to the world. And this works because the data is relatively simple. There's one sky, but it also works because it enhances the science and that cross correlations between wave, wavelengths and observatories allow new discoveries. With a virtual observatory like this though, the data doesn't have to be in the same place, but it does require consistent standards, which is why librarians are often involved. And it's a lovely test case because a, as an executive to Microsoft once uh, told me, uh, astronomy data is useless. And that's really what makes it a wonderful laboratory for uh, uh, using to investigate the tools of big data. You could learn lessons that we can apply to, for example, healthcare or national security, where the data must be protected as it's queried. So in my last minute, let me close with two comments. First, that open science depends on the context. As you've heard, it sounds great, but really, what's the goal? How does it advance the science itself? It's different for different fields, and so one size does not fit all, as these two examples illustrate. And second, we must not forget that international collaboration itself is open science. Uh, it's inevitable in particle physics and now astronomy because billion dollar projects require collaboration global collaboration, but barriers today to travel, to communication, and even to sharing intellectual property hinder such collaborations. At Triumph, we're under pressure to protect intellectual property for Canadians. But in a global collaboration, what is ours and what is theirs? We must remember that such collaborations give Canada a lot. In fact, I believe that Canada gets as much or more than it gives. So we in Canada gain by this open exchange, we gain by the competition, by the investments made by our partners. And we also gain from the network of collaborating institutions as demonstrating during this pandemic, when global, a global particle physics collaboration came to develop together to develop a, a, a new ventilator in a matter of weeks that is now being manufactured in Canada. And so this is a rich and complex subject differs field by field with a fantastic goal for the public and for science. And uh, I believe that appropriately defined, it benefits us all. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, John. Uh, Peter, um, as an expert in geomatics and cartography, um, I imagine access to global data is essential for your community and for your work. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your experiences and maybe some of the challenges that you see in uh, curating and accessing complex sets of data. Sure, thank you very much, Dan. Um, first, I'd like to recognize that Ottawa, where I reside, is located on the unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Um, I'm going to focus my comments on Arctic research, and this is dominated primarily by Earth sciences, but the balance is, is changing as time goes on. So I'm gonna start with a few remarks and then I'll refer to a few figures in, in a couple of minutes. Um, as you mentioned, Dan, as a specialist in geomatics and cartography, my research is focused on the ability um, of bringing, to bring information systems together and easily share uh, data across these systems. So this so-called interoperability is fundamental, I think, to achieving open science. Um, so in particular, I look at uh, linkages between science and indigenous knowledge as well. So in 2020, as we face these grand challenges, including climate change and of course the Corona-19 pandemic, we recognize that Arctic science and earth science in particular are critically important activities and not only for scientists, we're increasingly recognizing and realizing that the resulting observation data and science um, are a common good that result in many benefits to society as a whole. Um, so there've been a number of recent activities and initiatives to identify these benefits, benefits sorry, in science focusing on the Arctic, a region that is often recognized as an early warning system, particularly in relation to environmental change, um, is critically important to serving many applications, including climate change adaptation, of course, but also safe shipping, social programming, and food security in communities in the Arctic, to name a few, um, and even broader food security for, for the planet, um, we're realizing. 
As a research community, we have made significant progress in providing the foundation for interoperability and ocean, um, sorry, and open science over the last decade and more. So the international polar year that actually took place uh, from 2007 to 2009 brought the global community together through hundreds of science and education projects. Um, and this resulted really in a community-wide recognition of the value of open science and a preliminary framework for cooperation and some resulting technical advances. So there's still a lot of work to do, however, we're making some significant progress. It's easy for us to think that achieving Arctic open science and interoperability and so-called fair data is simply a matter of funding and implementing new technologies. And, and I often hear this in, in the community. Um, and this is part of the solution. However, the Arctic community presents an interesting case study to help us understand open interdisciplinary and cross-cultural science. So because this is a community defined by region and not by discipline, um, as the slide projects, uh, depicts, sorry, it is very diverse and complex. So earth sciences are foundational and account for a large proportion of the research data generated. However, the region includes research in the domains of life sciences, social sciences and the humanities, informatics and others. So critically important is the consideration also of other knowledge systems, entirely different systems and specifically indigenous knowledge. So increasingly indigenous knowledge is being shared in digital form, which brings a new set of opportunities and challenges. So our community faces all of the recognized open science challenges, including how to appropriately document the data, implementing fair data systems, developing appropriate mechanisms for attribution, intellectual property, maintain, maintaining currency and technology, and education and training um, of current and future researchers. However, the researcher that generated the graphic that you um, are seeing, I'm just going to double check that you are seeing it, yes. Um, has revealed another major challenge. Uh, the emerging Arctic and polar information ecosystem as we're calling is large and complex. It includes hundreds of organizations, data centers and other related entities. Um, so the inclu system includes information, data, et cetera, and technology, but of course there are many people and institutions involved as well. So this implies the need for coordination, collaboration and some form of governance. Um, although some progress is being made, as I said, um, there's a this is a fundamental limiting factor that we're finding with respect to achieving interoperability and fair data. Um, and it, it really comes down to what we think of as human interoperability. So finding appropriate coordination and government governance models that fit with the complexity, um, the fact that it's international, multicultural, it's interdisciplinary, it's distributed, and it's dynamic, very dynamic. The science is moving very quickly as um, a function of the environmental change and other changes that we're seeing. So this is proving very difficult for us as a community and it carries through to very detailed aspects of the open science. So those are all quite high level, but my next slide will give you a sense of some of the very detailed challenges that we're facing as researchers um, who are trying to achieve interoperability. So we can find this in our challenges related to achieving semantic interoperability or the sharing of meaning through machine mediation. So as I mentioned, there's an increased recognition of the value of indigenous knowledge of the Arctic and a great interest in linking this knowledge with Western science. So this requires a deep and nuanced understanding of both knowledge systems and natural language, and it's not strictly a technical expertise. So here's an example from a study we did a number of years ago. We we're looking at Inupiaq um, knowledge of sea ice, uh, and there's a definition here that I'll let you read. And the tendency when we were first looking at this was to say, well, you know, this uh, Inupiaq concept and term is equivalent to this uh, World Meteorological Organization term. Um, and so you can make a same as uh, statement in an information system. And what that results in, though, when you use machine reasoning is that you would then say the Inupiaq definition of Seguliak is actually including that 10 to 30 centimeters in thickness is a part of their definition. But in their knowledge system, it's not. They're not looking at the measurements as much as the functionality, how the, the ice can be used, whether it's safe for use and so on. And so to make these kinds of assertions, 
um, can be not only incorrect, but it actually can be um, uh, unsafe and possibly cause harm if it's misinterpreting uh, the, the nuances. So these are the types of things that we try and link the different knowledges that we're finding are, are very important, but also very time consuming, consuming and complex. So just in wrapping up, So as we move forward, we really need to think about a co-production model that engages a wide range of different expertise. All actors must work towards a co-production model that includes all relevant perspectives and knowledge systems. We have a number of excellent opportunities to make progress. Uh, the work of the Arctic Data Committee, the Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks Road Mapping or ROADS process, activities of the Arctic Council, major visionary policy developments coming from indigenous organizations and the Arctic science ministerial process all provide excellent possibilities to make progress. Uh, and Canada is actually playing a leadership role in many of these efforts. So ultimately to achieve our vision, we need to blend advances coming from the research data management community with new thinking though, from experts in organizational behavior, social psychology and policy to name just a few. And thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Peter, um, and thanks to, to all of their, our panelists today for their comments. Um, I'd like to move to kind of a, a discussion now um, and uh, amongst panel members, and Mona posed some questions. It's interesting that I will ask questions that I think are related, uh, but in the, in, the, in, the, in the opposite order. So, um, so, so I'd like to start with, with, with sort of uh, sharing ideas around open science culture. There are many communities that do not yet have a, a culture of practicing open science, and, and when I speak to some members that I know, um, they some have expressed skepticism about the the value proposition for their science. And so I just like to maybe pose this general question: What are the most compelling incentives for our research communities to shift to an open science culture? And maybe what are some of the most uh, some of the most challenging risks that uh, that we need to manage? And I will just allow somebody to start talking rather than to, to, to poke anyone. Who wants to, who wants to start? I, I can start by saying um, amongst academics where the um, one's uh, career progression is based on uh, publishing, being the first to publish in your area uh, and publishing in the best journals, best in quotes, um, we have to, if we're going to um, promote open sharing, even before publication, um, and the risks that someone else may um, use that data, this is what this is a big thing that's preventing um, many academics from sharing before something's fully published in a journal, um, is the fear of being scooped. And, and Dr. Babella mentioned this. So if we can figure out as a community ways to get around that, I think maybe the physics community has overcome that with the preprints and people don't pinch each other's data, but I think other communities have not gotten there. So it's a societal thing within the academic community. Uh, and then also at the institutional level and, and how one evaluates um, uh, professors for promotion, et cetera, to take these issues into account as well. Other comments? And so certainly in the physics community, uh, I think now people are giving uh, primacy to the uh, archive the, uh, 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 for the date of the discovery and not to the actual publication. Although the publication itself is important for uh, promotion and, and, and evaluation for tenure. I guess the easy answer to, my, to the question from my point of view is uh, when, when it's, uh, certainly when it's interest in, in the interest of the scientists, uh, open access goes fast, uh, for example, in the astronomy community, where you can really get value. Uh, but there is resistance in the particle physics community because it's really expensive and really difficult to make uh, the data available outside of the collaboration. 
I might just add that I, I think along those lines in the polar community, we're starting to see traction where the, the researchers see the benefits and particularly around system science. So it's becoming really um, critical to think in, in a systems um, way and particularly bringing in the physical and the social sciences and so on. And that's very difficult to achieve without um, some level of open science. So we're starting to see a lot of progress there, particularly with um, younger generation uh, I think some of the the older generation are tending to think more in in their particular disciplines, um, but there is there is a lot of um, good good outcomes that we're seeing in those uh, interdisciplinary approaches. So, I, I work with a, a lot of different science communities, including the International Poll Year many years ago on their on their designing or developing their initial data governance models. But, you know, it's so important for the communities to come together to the realization themselves. But every community that I work with, whether it's, you know, Snow and Ice data or whether it's genomics, they all come to the questions as if they're the first ones to have ever confronted these challenges and issues. And so I think the, the cross learning um, um, between communities that engage in open science is really important. But you're not going to get anywhere unless you have that co-creation grassroots um, uh, momentum to move forward. That's where the, the you know, conversations about um, systemization, uh, data structures, and a general sense of community and community building and the, the governance rules uh, in place uh, come in. That said, uh, you get what you measure and you measure the wrong things, you get the wrong behaviors. So incentives matter, whether they're at the academic um, uh, level or whether at the, they're at the level of the journals in terms of you know, deposit of data or deposit of materials, or whether at the, they're at the level of the funders. And up until now, the funders have required data, data plans, data sharing plans, but they've been relatively hands off in the enforcement space. Uh, and we're starting to see a shift in that uh, at, NI at NIH that there needs to be a little bit of a balance in terms of actual monitoring and enforcement. Maybe I'll just, I'll just probe on this just a bit more. Um, in my organization, we have, there are parts of my organization that would collect data that actually has implications for areas of science that are beyond the things that they're interested in. And, and so, and, and I'm suspect it's similar in particle physics and in the astronomy. Is this something that's fairly general? That um, it's not necessarily always a question of competition uh, in a single area of science, but sharing data to support multiple areas? I can twist your question a tiny bit in that I, there's been a lot of uh, uh, work in the astronomy community about how to build these virtual observatories where the data resides at different observatories around the world and how can you, uh, you put out one query that then goes to all of these different observatories. And it is actually very similar to the questions of in, in the national security space where you're looking for something but uh, no particular agency wants its data fully available but you can somehow query it from outside or the health space, but we're so concerned about our, our private um, information. So we can start developing those techniques about how to federate data uh, using data where the stakes are much lower uh, in, in, the, in the community. So, so let, me, let me change subjects then. And um, in a couple of cases, we touched on the, the I'm gonna say the question of the openness of open science. And uh, I'm interested in your views of, of how we approach this. And, and ultimately, as we start thinking about fair, uh, the FAIR concept, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, you, reusable, uh, who owns this, uh, this data assurance quality, or data, sorry, quality assurance uh, challenge? How, how, how do you imagine that we organize ourselves in the various areas of science? Well, I think I think different communities come together to to set standards. Uh, it, it can't work otherwise, right? Um, and those communities need to have participation from all stakeholders. So we were talking earlier in the week about you know about uh, private um, privacy and uh, c consent and ethics and uh, and and citizen engagement. In in my community, it would be patient engagement. 
And it's really important to have um, the, the publics that are impacted engaged in all of the different stages of setting or establishing the governance rules. And open doesn't necessarily mean completely open, right? Open means as open as possible. And so you can still have, you know, uh, controlled arenas. Uh, for example, you know, there are real concerns around uh, working with um, indigenous communities and issues of, of, of data sovereignty. Um, you know, where you are putting, you know, full control over those aspects of the data in the hands of, in the hands of community to establish their, their own rules um, around use um, and, and access. So, you know, I think, I, I think the answer is always it depends, um, but there are mechanisms or governance, that's where the governance piece comes in, because you're making it as open as possible with the integration of, uh, uh, of, of uh, the stakeholders, including, and most importantly, those that are affected or have contributed the data. I might just, oh, sorry, I see Jonathan. I was gonna ask what the question, what's the role of the government in, meeting the, in mediating those discussions in communities and across communities? I think government can provide resources <laughs> for starters, um, can, can also provide uh, incentives, um, uh, can, can, get, can act, serve in a convening function to actually kickstart the conversations as, as, as Dr. Niemer's initiative obviously, obviously has been, um, and, can, and also has the, the, uh, somewhat of a protective role in, this, in making sure that, um, that rules uh, and laws that are there to protect form, specific forms of data are in fact followed. Peter. I would also suggest that um, in the international arena, you know, governments play a very important role of establishing how we're going to work together as countries. One of the big challenges we have right now in the Arctic is there are definitely sovereign states but there are many other countries interested who are not the, the sovereign Arctic nations. So establishing those governance mechanisms um, is it's challenging. The Arctic Council plays a role, but they're not necessarily seen as representative of all actors. And so that's something I think we need to really figure out and figure out quickly in the Arctic um, because of the urgency of it to understand how those governments are going to work together and also resource the international aspects, which right now most of the funding happens at a national level. So. If I, if I could just pick up on something that, that Tanya mentioned, um, and that is, uh, uh, yes, it's, uh, it, it's always helpful when, the, when, the, when governments at all levels uh, are providing the necessary resources, but I was wondering the kinds of incentives, when you say also incentives, um, I wonder if we could articulate a bit in the kinds of incentives that we're thinking about other than financial. So um, some of the, the a lot of the incentives have to do with with uh, with the way that we fund research, right? Intramural or extramural research. Um, so a lot of the incentives that, uh, attached to the rules through which the, the the funding flows to actually support the science, um, and that is a very very strong signal. Um, having dealt with a lot of uh, NIH funded funded programs over the years. You know, I think that the hands-off piece on the compliance um, has now been recognized as having been problematic. And so um, they're stepping up the, the, the compliance. You, know, you don't get your next round of tranche of funding if you didn't uh, accord with your, with your data plan in, the, in your last set of funding, for example. That's a little harsh and you don't uh, want to go straight there, but it, but it, is, an, it is important. But also, I think the, the, the framework really sets up uh, an exemplar to say that the government is willing, intramural science is going to be open and, and setting, a, setting up the example for other, other communities to follow. It's very important. So there are carrots and sticks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'll comment that um, in my experience uh, with multiple um, international consortia, when the community establishes a clear um, consensus on what should be uh, shared uh, openly and the, the data structure, um, that all the scientists are, are, are typically very interested in doing that and, and will do that. Um, 
but need the resources to do that, the, the data infrastructure, the IT infrastructure, and the, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the funding for the personnel to, to be able to take the time to do this. And that's, all, that's often a challenge. I'll, I'll throw in one more word and that's sustainability. Um, right. There's a lot of resources uh, that are, are created that aren't necessarily then uh, continued. Um, their, their sustainability is always in question. The period of the um, grant, which creates a huge resource, but then cannot be maintained. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, the issue of incentives is important. Um, and I'll just segue to the next sex session, section by saying um, Peter Senge from MIT, maybe, I don't know if he wrote this first, but it's, he's the first person I've seen where I read it. And this is the idea that people don't resist change, they resist being changed. <laughs> and so, um, so, so to the extent that we provide incentives for for why a new way of being is more advantageous, then um, people will go there. But if if, uh, if if we simply just put in rules, uh, then there will be resistance. And I think that's just, just about everything. If you have kids, same thing. So um, I'd like to move on just for a, one last question. And that is, uh, so Mona started, uh, ended with saying that uh, uh, what advice can be given? How do we organize ourselves? Let me just reflect that question back. And that is, how do we organize ourselves? And maybe more specifically, you know, what role could the, could the Royal Society of Canada play in organizing coherent, consistent feedback uh, to, uh, to Mona and her team as we start thinking about this transition? I was wondering who wants to have a kick at that one. I, I Sorry, I'm, I'm terrible at, 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 at awkward silences, so I'll, I'll move in. <laughs> so, um, you know, things like the, 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 the COVID-19 task force has been in an incredible model about bringing uh, uh, Royal Society-led but community building uh, around specific topics for, I think, a, a fairly um, coherent set of reports on a variety of topics related to COVID-19. I think we could encourage the same um, for open science because it really does have to come from the communities. But the Royal Society has such a breadth of expertise um, that you really could coalesce um, uh, around specific leaders in those communities to, uh, to help inform the, um, all of the, the governance and the rules and the interests and the issues um, that are specific to communities and then maybe convene it all together to see the commonalities. Other comments? I, I would agree with that. I think one of the things we're seeing is um, often a lot of fragmentation, um, duplication of efforts and so on, because the funders are not necessarily seeing across the community and the individual researchers are doing their thing. But if you have an organization like the Royal Society that can see across, I think that could really help. And particularly with really hard investments like data infrastructure, um, which costs a lot and costs a lot to maintain, uh, we won't end up seeing, you know, the same type of portal for the same kind of data, you know, at different institutions, or at least if there are, they're going to think about interoperability and making sure we can establish this distributed system, which is the way that we're, we're working in the polar community now, we're working towards that. Right. So, um, I'd like to jump in as well and just say that this uh, is a great role for the Royal Society. I know that in the, the US, the National Academies reports have really tremendous impact and uh, they're respected. And I believe the uh, Royal Society reports uh, should, 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 as the COVID report has uh, been a first step, could be moving uh, in, that, in that direction. Very important. I would also like to see the granting councils be less passive, frankly. They could be uh, more of a convening, they could also play a convening role. And certainly both those uh, happen in the U.S. where the funding agencies pull people together to, to address these issues and then the academies are over it all. And I could see that happening here in Canada as well. All right. And and one maybe one comment I would make is that the, the uh, division structure in our academies uh, is somewhat representative of the diversity of science across Canada and, uh, and scholarship across Canada, not just science. And, um, and I could imagine each division 
uh, coming together to bring forward its own unique perspective. And they may all be different, but I think we need to see all of those different perspectives. And that could be something that could be organized within the RSC. So um, I, I'm not seeing any audience questions and we're pretty much close to our one hour time limit. And so first I wanna remind everyone that um, there is at one o'clock a session on open science publishing. So, so that um, this session was not intended to cover publishing, but that is another important aspect of our transition. Uh, and so I wanna thank everyone and I want to turn back to, to Mona and, and give her the opportunity to, uh, to reflect on what she's heard today and, and, to, and to close out the session for us. So Mona, it's back to you. Thank you very much, Dan, and the colleagues, thank you very much for your very thoughtful uh, you know, input and for the examples that you have provided that uh, I think illustrate both uh, the opportunities and uh, as well the, the challenges. Um, so uh, I would add, uh, you know, like uh, the devils in the details, I, I think, as uh, as some of you have inferred and others have, have uh, you know, uh, put it very clearly. Um, I would say that, you know, some, uh, um, you know, we can take examples from those that are a bit ahead of other, you know, some fields like... Uh, um, I think John mentioned the, 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 the physics community is, is ahead of others. Uh, you know, some fear um, you, the impact because it's, um, you know, they, they haven't really thought about it. There is no uh, practice within the community. So I think that we, we need to both look um, sort of, uh, uh, you know, in, in disciplinary manner uh, and also regionally and, and, and uh, you know, broadly internationally. I think in terms of the uh, uh, carrots and sticks and the incentives, um, I, I believe that an international collaboration on this is extremely important. M multiple projects are funded by more than one organizations, often international, and having similar uh, support systems and similar requirements, I think will go a long way. Um, I'll leave some thought uh, with you uh, on in terms of uh, carrots and sticks. Um, in Europe, uh, the Germans and some of the European um, Union uh, programs have uh, started looking only at um, at what's uh, op openly available in terms of pub, uh, you know research output. So no longer you put your ten best or or what you've published in the past few years. Uh, if there, if it's not uh, uh, accessible openly, then it doesn't count. So maybe um, re you know reflect on, on such maybe draconian uh, approach, but how to how to get there may be important. And I think that I would say the the last one is uh, I would in, invite us all and in, invite you know, all the uh, fellows of the Royal Society and their colleagues, maybe to engage in um, in local at the institutional level uh, conversations in terms of, uh, um, you know, the, the, the needs in terms of infrastructure, the needs in terms of the young researchers, uh, etc. So I think that to, to succeed, it's like a, a whole of, uh, you know, Canada of society, of, of uh, research, of uh, scholarship, and of different levels of uh, researchers uh, uh, approach. So uh, I think we're only at the beginning of the, of the road. And uh, Dan, merci beaucoup de me donner l'opportunité d'écouter, de donner l'opportunité à nos collègues de nous dire qu'est-ce qu'il y a à faire. Puis j'espère encore une fois que c'est ce, le début et non pas la fin d'une de la conversation. Alors merci à vous tous. Okay, and I want to thank everyone as well for uh, for for your for, for the interaction, for the insights. Uh, I look forward to the continued discussions. And with that, I think we can call this uh, panel session to a close. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a great rest of the weekend. Merci. Thank you. Merci. Au revoir. Thank you. Au revoir.